Hey guys, welcome to Jonah, messenger version. The messenger version, once again, is not exactly a study Bible. It's something that, the type of translation that is meant to be heard just to get the gist, the general understanding of something. And I hope you enjoy. Introduction to Jonah. Everybody knows about Jonah. People who have never read the Bible know enough about Jonah to laugh at a joke about him and the whale. Jonah has entered our folklore. There is a playful aspect to his story, a kind of slapstick clumsiness about Jonah as he bumbles his way along trying, but always unsuccessfully, to avoid God. But the playfulness is not frivolous. This is deadly serious. While we, are while we are smiling or laughing at Jonah, we drop the guard with which we are trying to keep God at a comfortable distance. And suddenly we find ourselves caught in the purposes and commands of God. All of us, no exceptions. Stories are the most prominent biblical way of helping us see ourselves in the quote, the God story. End quote, which always gets around to the story of God making and saving us. Stories, in contrast to abstract statements of truth, tease us into becoming participants in what is being said. We find ourselves involved in the action. We may start out as spectators or critics, but if the story is good, and the biblical stories are very good, we find ourselves no longer just listening to, but inhabiting the story. So what does that mean? It means that as we get along in these stories and get to really be familiarize ourselves with it, we find ourselves in them, in our daily lives. Yes, even today in 2019, we will. The basics are still the same. So these stories will become more and more alive the more and more you experience of life, if you're very young, I'm speaking to you. If you're older, you already know. And if you don't know, start reading these stories and you'll be like, I'll be damned. Well, not really, I'll be damned, but you know, I'll be darned. Like these stories are all over the place in my life and in my neighbor's life and in my coworker's life and in my heart. Let's see, one reason that Jonah's story is so enduringly important for nurturing the life of faith in us is that Jonah is not a hero too high and mighty for us to identify with. Oh no, he's not. He didn't want to. Oh, he did not want to. And he had issues with his neighbors and he was like, screw my neighbors, <laughs> you know, and not his neighbors, but the people he was being asked to preach to. He was like, no, nah, I don't want to. <laughs> no, nah, screw them. I don't care. And by and by, the father corrected that in his life for the better of, betterment of all. It took a minute, though, as we will see. One reason that Jonah's story is so enduringly important for nurturing the life of faith in us is that Jonah is not a hero too high and mighty for us to identify with. He doesn't do anything, quote-unquote, great. Oh, but he does. Instead of being held up as an ideal to admire, we find Jonah as a companion in our ineptness or dumb, dumb moments, <laughs> or like, I didn't want to, let's see, here is someone on our level, even when Jonah does, does it right, like preaching finally in Nineveh, he does it wrong by getting angry at God, what, right, but the whole time God is working within and around Jonah's very ineptness, and accomplishing his purposes in him. Most of us need a biblical friend or two like Jonah. In other words, we will undoubtedly come short of what our potential was in times of the Father using us. But worry not. Through perseverance, you keep trucking and you keep clinging to the Father. Oh, he will use you. He will, he will use you for good. Almost sometimes in a surprising way, considering how often we fight against it. Let's see. From, 
As a young man, Jonah had predicted a period of mil had a predicted a period of military might and economic prosperity in Israel. So that was what he prophesied at a young age, and it had happened. Assyria, the dangerous northern superpower, had been temporarily weak, but a couple of decades later, God sent His flag-waving patriot to save Assyria's capital, Nineveh, from destruction from Israel that was destined to be a national security disaster. Two, we don't know if Jonah lived, in, lived to see Assyria wipe his country off the map, but for his fellow patriots who did, the idea of God having compassion for the Assyrians was unthinkable. Well, how often do we think, oh, the father would just pick us and never them. No, no, no never them. They're, they're barbarians. They're heathens. They're terrorists. Well, think again. Assyria practiced war by terror and environmental devastation. We do that today. It was the ultimate evil empire. How could God love those people? Well, he does. Uh, regarding, or about 780 to 760 BC is the time that Jonah took a ship to Tartish. Tartish, that's, those are very fast ships, by the way. Um, this may have been Tartissos, a port on the southern coast of Spain. God sent him east to Nineveh, uh, Nineveh, 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 oh my gosh, N-I-N-E-V-E-H. My mind is having trouble with that. So when you ever hear me read in the next few pages anything re resounding to the name of Nineveh, Nineveh, gosh, N-I-N-E-V-E-H is what I'm trying to say. Okay. It's awfully dark. Why is it so dark? I checked this shit earlier. Uh, the sun moves. What are you going to do? Don't look at my zit on my forehead. Yeah, right. Okay, so I just pointed it out. Anyway, the Straiters of Tartessos had a sailing route to the Tin Islands of the coast of Britain. Now, Tartish, the Tartish fleet were like super badass sailors um, since before Christ walked around, obviously. Um, 780 to 760 BC. They were the ones that were, um, they didn't really have a lot of, they were like the pirates. They were really classy pirates. They were really uh, a powerful fleet of pirates uh, that ultimately gave us our alphabet and a lot of our numbers. The Greek and the Roman used their, the Tardish uh, alphabet and stuff to pretty much create what ultimately became our language. So... They were just interested in making money, and a lot of times, especially towards the end, they became very underhanded, but they traveled everywhere. They were a huge superpower because they had such fast ships, and they were so good at trading, and, well, they just had a lot of experience. So, the tra the, the traders of, that's what I mean by traders, not like, uh, traders, uh, no, more like traders, like they traded stuff uh, at different ports. The traders of Tartessos had a sailing route to the tin islands off the coast of Britain. Tin was an essential component of bronze, one of the main metals used in those days. So traders carried it all the way from Britain via Tartessos to ports on the coast near Israel. So in other words, when Jonah wanted a flea, he picked the fastest group of the, the, like the, the fastest line of ships that he could possibly run away from. And if you don't know this story, yes, he tries to run away from God. Here we go. Jonah, running away from God. <laughs> okay. One, uh, chapter one. One day long ago, God's word came to Jonah, uh, Mittitis' son. Quote, up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Nineveh. There we go. Preach to them. They're in a bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. End quote. But Jonah got up and went to the other direction to Tarnish, running away from God. He went down to the port of Joppa and found a ship headed for Tardish, which is, by the way, like, I think it was near Spain or in Spain. So he was going from, whoo, went in all the way to Spain. He wanted out. He paid the fare and went on board, joining those going to Tardish, as far away from God as he could get. But God sent a huge storm at sea the waves towering. The ship was about to break into pieces. That's how hard the, the storm was. The sailors were terrified. They called out in desperation to their gods, small g gods. 
They threw everything they were carrying overboard to lighten the ship. Meanwhile, Jonah had gone down into the hold of the ship to take a nap. I know I wasn't going to interrupt, but can I just say what this reminds me of? What does it remind you of? Come on, you know the story. Okay, so remember when the disciples were on the ship and they were like freaking out because there was a big old storm and JC or Yeshua was down in the hold doing what? Taking a nap. Just saying. He was sound asleep. The captain came to him and said, what's this? Sleeping? Get up. Pray to your God. Lower G. God, but in one singular. May your God will see, maybe your God will see we're in trouble and rescue us. In other words, everybody's praying, bro. Everybody's trying to get this ship to not sink. Could you get up and do something instead of just laying there? And why was he just laying there? If you have God telling you to do something and you chose to run away, I mean, under what more condemnation can you be? So the fact that he thought he was on his way out, maybe that's why he was like, I don't care. You can kill me right here, right now. Either, either I'm going to get away or you're going to kill me because I don't want to go back and do what God said. Talk about being on that edge and being okay with it to the extent of taking a nap in the middle of a storm. Then the sailors said to one another, quote, let's get to the bottom of this. Let's draw straws to identify the culprit on this ship who's responsible for this disaster. Let's draw straws to see whose fault this is. Wow. They must have really had a lot of faith in their lower G gods to be all like, well, we're all praying and it ain't one of us. So it has to be one of us. So let's just, uh, let's draw straws. Well, whatever. They drew straws. And so they drew straws and Jonah got the short straw. There's got to be a spiritual reason why that went down that way. I just can't imagine other than God, uppercase God was like, all right, bro. You wanted to do it like this? Let's do it. And so I'm going to out you in front of everybody. So they drew straws and Jonah got the short straw. Then they grilled him. Quote, confess, why this disaster? What is your work? Where do you come from? What country? What family? He told them, quote, I am a Hebrew. I worship uppercase God, the God of heaven who made sea and land. And good for him for not pussying it out. I mean, he was like, all right, you're right. I mean, he wasn't going to deny the father. That's commendable. Maybe that's why the father chose him, huh? Through it all, he knew the one thing about Jonah is that he would not deny his father. So maybe that's why he got this job, eh? And that the men were frightened. At that, the men were frightened, really frightened, and said, What on earth have you done? As Jonah talked, the sailors realized that he was running away from God. They said to him, what are you, what are we going to do with you to get rid of this storm? By this time, the sea was wild, totally out of control. Jonah said, throw me overboard into the sea, then the storm will stop. Once again, he wasn't going to hurt others. He just didn't want to go back. And he did confess to the father, he just, just kill me. Go ahead, crucify me. Let's see. Throw me overboard into the sea. Then the storm will stop. It's all my fault. I'm the cause of the storm. Get rid of me and you'll get rid of the storm. Fascinating. Fascinating. But no. The men tried rowing back to the shore. They made no headway. The storm only got worse and worse, wild and raging. So they didn't want to throw him over the board. They didn't want that on their conscience. So they tried to go back. But it wasn't allowed. And they prayed to the uppercase God. Oh God, don't let us drown because of this man's life. And don't blame us for his death. You are God. Do what you think is best. They took Jonah and threw him overboard. Immediately the sea was quieted down. The sailors were impressed, no longer terrified by the sea, but in awe of uppercase God. 
They worshipped God, offered a sacrifice, and they made vows. What was the sacrifice? Was it their prayers or was it the strengthening of their sudden faith in Him due to the quieting of the storm? Hmm. Well, Jonah did his job there, I'll tell you that. Clearly, part of the journey that the Father either used for good when it was supposed to be for bad, him being denied and Jonah running away, instead he's like, no, no, there's lots of people on this ship I'd like to save. Go ahead, go ahead, run. <laughs> and now how many people on that ship are believers now because of Jonah? How many times have you been the agitator of a place that you didn't want to even be at? And all of a sudden, boom, the Father uses you to agitate them into a knowing, an awakening that may have seemed chaotic and like very tumultuous, but then, boom, when you leave, they're believers. What? How does it get better than that? Then God assigned a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly three days and nights. Three days and nights, he was stuck in this. And notice they don't say, well, they say big fish. Big fish. Big fish. So I'm, I'm trying to remember something that somebody told me, a gentleman up at Three Points that was um, not, is it that like the Greek Catholic Church and the Roman Catholic Church? Or There's two different types of Catholic churches that began back in the day, and one of them used the fish. He told me what it was for. And if anybody knows this, please put it in the comments because I've forgotten. That was a while back and I only heard it the one time. And it's like the fish, the reason that the, the Christians use the fish isn't because of the fish itself, believe it or not. From my understanding of it, from what I recall, it was fish was, you know how we use F-I-S-H, like that could represent, each letter could represent something else. Well, back in the day, it's what it meant. And it was actually five letters. I believe and ultimately it was uh, I forget what the word is but it's when you use a word a, a word like fish but it actually represents different uh, each each letter represents different words and that's what they meant um, oh I had it written down somewhere but it's gone now so if anybody even understands what I'm trying to say there and knows about it please please write it in the comments anyway then God assigned a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Jonah was in the fish's belly for three days and nights, which is, of course, a very common number. It, to me, in short, I mean, it means multiple things, but in this, I'm just going to keep it simple. It, it, three days and three nights usually has to do with the Father. Kind of like when you get, when you're trying to figure out something and you want to always seek confirmation. So you think it is, but you want to make sure it's not the enemy, so you ask for a confirmation and you get it usually very quickly within two or three days and then there is that ultimate act you know whether you asked or whether the father usually just gives you a third confirmation of yes i want you to go this way instead of that way because it's uh that third confirmation is very powerful it's like almost undeniable you're like oh okay definitely doing this instead of that confirmations they're important ask for them he'll give them to you at the bottom of the sea chapter two then Jonah prayed to his God from the belly of the fish. Oh, he prayed. And the prayer was, in trouble, deep trouble, I prayed to God. He answered me. From the belly of the grave, I cried, help. You heard my cry. You threw me into the ocean's depth, into a watery grave, with ocean waves, ocean breakers crashing over me. I said, I've been thrown away, thrown out, out of your sight. I'll never again lay eyes on your holy temple. Sounds like condemnation in one end, and absolute abandonment on another. Ocean gripped me by the throat. The ancient abyss grabbed me and held tight. My head was all tangled in seaweed and the bottom of the sea where the mountains take root. I was as far down as a body can go and the gates were slamming shut behind me forever. Yet you pulled me up from that grave alive. Oh God, 
my God. And another Yeshua remembrance. Well, after Jesus was crucified, he went down to hell for three days to retrieve the gates, the, the keys of death from hell himself and to minister to all those in Shoal, Shoal um, they hadn't been ministered to, so they too could have a choice. They too could be saved. They, should, they too could be freed from this endless abyss. Yet you pulled me up from that grave alive as Yeshua came back alive. Oh God, my God, when my life was slipping away, oh my gosh, remember the Christ's last words on that cross? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh God, my God, when my life was slipping away, I remembered God and my prayer got through to you made it all the way to your holy temple. Those who worship hollow gods, lowercase g gods, god frauds, to walk away from their only true love. He didn't just walk away. He ran away, got in the fastest ship he could find, and took a nap. But what? Talk about repentance here, right? But I'm worshiping you, God, uppercase g, calling out in thanksgiving. Push me to that edge. I started to fall over, but you grabbed me and hauled me back. And all I and all and I'll do what I promised I'd do. Salvation belongs to God. Uppercase G. Then God spoke to the fish, and it vomited it up Jonah on the seashore. That's most likely where the jokes come from. Not only was he stuck in the belly of a big fish. <laughs> Got vomited out three days later. Maybe God will change his mind. Chapter three. Next, God spoke to Jonah a second time. <clears throat> Up on your feet and on your way to the big city of Nineveh. Preach to them. They're in bad way and I can't ignore it any longer. Help my people is what he's saying. This time Jonah started off straight for Nineveh obeying God's order to the letter. Was, Nineveh was a big city, very big. It took three days to walk across it. Three again. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk and preached. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Everyone did it, rich and poor. Oh, that's impressive. The rich and the poor listened. Famous and obscure, leaders and followers. Listen to a fishy smelling guy walking in, one day walk. They all listened to him. They were on the brink of being smashed when they listened. If you're in California, you know that when that 7.1 earthquake happened not very long ago, like a little over a month ago, less than two months ago, I wrote to Damien and was like, can you please pray for California? My peeps are all over there. Everyone I've ever known before a year and a half ago is there. My family, my friends, my school mates, my teachers, my coworkers, my best friends, my enemies, they're all there. And he wrote, and I wrote this whole thing. I said, could you just help me in prayer? And uh, Damien wrote back, California's gonna be smashed. That's why I took a beat when I read that. Jonah entered the city, went one day's walk and preached. In 40 days, Nineveh will be smashed. So if you saw me go, whoa, <laughs> that's what it was. So, but they were about to be smashed. And according to all the earthquake and volcano experts, California is about to be smashed. So if you're in California and you've 
ever wanted, please listen to this. If you've ever wanted to preach the, salva the salvation of the way to anybody, take this as a challenge, just as a quinkening due to one word smashed here in this translation, what it reminded me of. If you're in California, or you know somebody in California, take the next 40 days to preach to them about the salvation of the way. Whether they move out or not is not really a thing. Not at this point. It's more of a give them an opportunity to be like these people here. Whether rich or poor, famous or infamous, or not known at all. Please take the time in the next 40 days to do so. Because why not? You will be blessed. The people of Nineveh listened and trusted God. They proclaimed a citywide fast and dressed in burlap to show their repentance. Burlap being, of course, very, very uncomfortable. So they chose to make themselves uncomfortable so that they could focus not on what would distract them, but instead being uncomfortable, they would focus on the Father. Everyone did it, rich and poor, famous and obscure, leaders and followers. Talk about a space and time they really could. Have you ever talked to rich people or famous people? I haven't very often, but I hear that they're really hard to um, swayed. And here they all were, perfectly willing to be swayed. When the message reached the king of Nineveh, he got up off his throne, threw down his royal robes, dressed in burlap, and sat down in the dark. Everybody knew something was coming in Nineveh. They were ready. They were. They just needed somebody to preach to them. And all that intuition in their guts, and all that fear in their heart, and all that chaos in their head became silent as they heard the truth and repented. Then he issued a public proclamation throughout Nineveh, authorized by him and his leaders, quote, not one drop of water, not one bite of food for men, woman, or animal. Notice no kids, not one. Kids are already safe. Including your herds and flocks. Dress them all, both people and animals, in burlap. What do you think about that, Dex? He's like, dress me in burlap, but what did I do? I don't know, buddy. Um, threw down, okay, so dress them all, both men and animal, in burlap and send up a cry for help to God. Everyone must turn around, turn back from the evil life and the violent ways that strain their hands. Who knows? Maybe God will turn around and change his mind about us, Quite quit being angry with us and let us live. Well, God already loves you. And he definitely wants you to not feel like you're in a place of evil. He definitely wants you not to do evil. He definitely wants you to stop being angry at whatever it is that's causing your unrest. And he definitely wants you to focus on life, not revenge, not trying to correct others, not trying in the sense of like, oh, that's my job. No, it's not. Um, so all that sort of muckety muck he wants you to do is stop blaming him for your fault. Stop putting it on him and saying, oh, he's angry at us. No, you're angry at yourself because the father in you, the Christ in you, your conscience in you is in a state of unrest. So the Christ in you isn't balanced, isn't at peace. So you're angry at yourself for that. Find out what it is that's taking your peace away. Self-correct. Mm -hmm. The Christ in you will bounce out like a ray of sunshine. It'll be like, woo! You'll be fine. You will. Just heal yourself. Stop being angry at yourself. Stop being angry at others. Stop doing anything that keeps you out of your peace. God saw that they, what they had done. 
that they had turned away from their evil lives, he did change his mind about them. He didn't change his mind. He saw that they weren't being goofballs anymore and was like, okay, they're good. <laughs> what he said he could do to them, what he said he would do to them, he didn't do. Well, I thought God was supposed to change his mind. Well, God's just going to look at you as the truth that you are in that moment. So if you're in the light, you walk with him. If you're in the dark, he's going to send some light your way so that you can see the difference. And it's up to you to repent. It's up to you to change your mind. I knew this was going to happen. Chapter 4. This is when it gets interesting. Jonah was furious. Wow. So you went from, I don't want to, to running away, getting caught up, repenting, going to go to do your job, doing it well, seeing your fruits of your labor spawn this beautiful response. And now Jonah's mad about it? Let's find out why. I knew this was going to happen. Chapter 4. Jonah was furious. He lost his temper. He yelled at God. God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. So now we get to the point as to why he ran away. That's why I ran off to Tardish. I knew you were sheer, I knew you were sheer grace and mercy. So where's this angry God they thought that, 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 that they were talking about a minute ago? I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love, and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. Oh, Jonah, he's so funny. So, God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. What the F is he on? Why is he tripping? Let's keep finding out. God said, what do you have to be angry about? He wanted revenge to be his. He wanted them to get theirs. He didn't want them to be saved. He wanted them to be smashed. God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out of the city to the east and sat down in a sulk. He put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city. God arranged for a broad... He just left. He just walked off. He's like, nah. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to talk about it. I already told you. It's clear. You're going to forgive him. I think that's BS. I'm going to sit over here and soak. See what happens next. Was he really, and it was his intent to really see the glory of the Father in his program of forgiveness? Or was he waiting for something else to happen, for them to screw it up, and for them to be all like, smashed? Jonah, Jonah, Jonah. God arranged for a broad leaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulk. Oh, Father's amazing. Father's like, well, I'm just going to put him over here, give him some shade, give him some love. He'll get over it. He'll fall right into gratitude, right into, oh, and he'll go right back. Because Father knows us. He's like, this guy just needs needs a little time off to cool off. Let me, let me put some, let me get some loving on him. He'll cool off. God arranged for a broad leaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him off his angry sulk. Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. Life was looking up. <laughs> but then God sent a worm. By dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the shade tree and it withered away. The sun came up and God sent a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. He prayed to die, a better off dead. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry 
about this shade tree. Jonah said, plenty of right. It made me angry enough to die. It made me angry enough to die. Have we ever blamed a situation or a person or a people's circumstances for our reactions? For our feelings or what course we reacted to and taking they made me feel this way that is why I'm like this we all have this is a lesson here in Jonah at least in this part plenty of right it's made me angry enough to die God said what's this how is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You either planted, you, ni you neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure. This big city of more than 120,000 childlike people who don't yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of all the innocent animals. And that's it. <laughs> that was it. Did you enjoy that? You might want to go check out the ESV version or the Amplified version or the English Standard version. No, that's what I just said. What was the other one? There was another one that was good. Um, I forget. Christina told me about it. I downloaded it on my phone, but I haven't gotten into it yet. But there you go. 37 minutes. And you just got through all of Jonah with me. Tell me how it hit you. Let's see, how did it hit me? <sighs> many, many ways of my observations as of late. But for me personally, how did it hit me? Well, it made me laugh. Why did I laugh? In recognition of the past and how often I suffered because of it. How often I created storms in my self-pity and in my victimization. It makes me laugh now because I'm in gratitude that I'm no longer there. That I no longer run away. That I now recognize things I didn't recognize before and I'm able to self-correct. In gratitude. I love you guys. We'll see what we read tomorrow. Mwah.